Hey there, human beings and people who are listening to this podcast to, tonight. It's Gatogast time again. We are talking about the universe, astrophysics and other boring subjects. I know. I'm so sorry. I would like to say something fun tonight, but I'm not in the mood. And so I guess I'll just keep my um, explaining the universe to Joey Timayo series about the universe about everything that's going around us on very, very uh, far away places. So thanks a lot for joining me. Thanks a lot for listening to this podcast. I know that this is, I mean, most of the people that are listening to it. It's not the first time <laughs> that they are here. But for those who um, join me for the first time, then I recommend you you know, you can listen to the former episodes on Spotify, you can find them on Apple Music, you can find them on YouTube, wherever you may fancy. So, and just as a reminder, in this podcast, uh, you know, I'm talking about pretty much everything that comes to my mind. So it can be languages, physics, or anything nanowar related. And again, tonight's episode is going to be, uh, I think it's a third one in the series of... Uh, Explaining the Universe to J.D. Mayo, which is the series of sort of uh, lectures. I don't like the word term, but uh, whatever. It's like lectures dedicated to astrophysics, astronomy, cosmology, the subject that I'm supposed to be an expert in. And um, if you remind, like last time we had a couple of episodes where we introduced the general concepts of astrophysics and astronomy that was the first episode um, where we i was talking about the um, differences between cosmology which is the study of very large scale structures so of uh, thousands of galaxies thousands of uh, objects at the same time um, and astrophysics which is most um, it's a term that is mostly used for it's referred to the study of individual objects, so individual stars, individual galaxies, um, using physics. So again, it's uh, physical laws, it's the kind of laws that we know they work on Earth, and then we sort of extrapolate these laws, so we know how gases, we know how light and radiation and um, atoms work on Earth, and then we sort of uh, extrapolate this behavior and apply it to objects that are far away. And so we assume, of course, that the behavior of gases and uh, atoms is the same here as well as on Andromeda or Virgo or any other galaxy in the nearby or far away universe. And um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, that's a star that in general, that's the idea of uh, astrophysics. It's using the laws of physics to study remote objects. And then again, just as a reminder, just to sort of connect today's episode to what we were talking about in the past. Um, last time I was talking about distances in the universe. Because, you know, it's um, you might see things on the sky, but then determining their actual distance might be a kind of tricky um, task it's not so easy to say um, well that star that i'm seeing here is uh, i don't know a few million years far away it's not something that you can really um, it's not easy to compute so to say it's not something that you can estimate easily and so if you remember i introduced the concept of um, a standard candle which is the idea that some objects that are here nearby us that we know very well that uh, we can find some object that belongs to the same class and uh, has the same properties. And so when we see the same object that looks like something that we know here in our neighborhood, but we see it far away, then we can sort of extrapolate the distance of this object. And this is the idea of standard canons. For example, I was talking about cepheids stars and cepheids are a class of stars that uh, fluctuate. So they have some kind of, uh, they don't have a constant luminosity, but they have some kind of fluctuation. So they uh, they have some pulse. So they, you know, they um, sort of move back and forth. So they uh, expand and contract in a continuous loop. And um, 
the period then in which they have this uh, contraction and expansion uh, phase, it's very standardized in the sense that it's very much related to their luminosity. So if you know that a star, a Seyfried star is pulsating with a period of five days, which means that after five days, uh, every five days it's reaching the peak luminosity curve, then you can uh, you can sort of know what what the absolute luminosity is, and once you see this, uh, once you see this uh, this kind of object in a very far away galaxy, for example, then what happens is that you can reconstruct the distance of these objects because you know its intrinsic luminosity. So it's like the idea is like you have a light close to you, and then you put this very light far away from you and since you know what's intrinsic magnitude and since you know that the light is traveling from some space and in this space it's undergoing some attenuation it's got some you know diffusion and dispersion process then you can reconstruct the distance between you and the source of light itself so this was the idea of standard candles and why is this important because this is uh, a way that we can study faraway objects by in a way studying nearby objects so nearby stars or nearby galaxies or other kinds um, usually it's stars actually that we would use as um, a sort of um, standard candles so objects that we can use to uh, gauge and measure the distance in the um, in the cosmos or in the universe and so why is this important again is that um, this is a way that we can actually measure distances and that we can learn about the structure of the universe by learning how much galaxies are actually far away from us and this might be uh, maybe some kind of um, you know um, trivial idea nowadays because we are sort of accustomed to the fact that we are not uh, the only galaxy that there's many galaxies out there so as a reminder, a galaxy is basically a collection of uh, thousands uh, of billions of stars. So it can be some, it, it's in the range of the billions of stars. It can be hundreds, it can be thousands, it can be tens of uh, billions. It pretty much depends on the kind of galaxy, whether it's a dwarf galaxy, whether it's a huge uh, elliptical galaxy, it's a um, disk galaxy. Um, either way, it's um, we are always talking about objects that have billions of stars within it and so the idea that each galaxy lives on its own and it's not some kind of um, it's not a part of a continuum so it's not a part of something that is the um, it's um, you know it's just one huge block of matter and everything is filled um, the universe does not actually look like that at all so and we can find this out because we can measure distances. So we know how far away is each galaxy from its, from each other. And so this is something that we can do very well in the local universe. And by local universe, I mean distances of the order of a few tens of um, millions of light years, which is, again, um, it's the distance that the light... Um, covers in a few million light years so one million light years uh, for example is the distance uh, i think it's a, it's actually two million light years is the distance that separates us the milky way from andromeda which is the closest large galaxy that is the um it's our cosmic neighbor and so it means that in two million years um, if you would travel at the speed of life then you would reach andromeda the andromeda galaxy which is pretty, it's a, it's a very large distance. And again, measuring this thing is at all non-trivial. We need to rely on distance indicators, such as these classes of stars that we know they live in our neighborhood. But uh, then we can find some somehow also in, um, in, other, in other places in the universe. So let me just uh, answer... Um, couple of questions um, 
Okay, so first thing there, uh, dark matter and dark energy contribute to the expansion of the universe. Well, yes, uh, I'm not talking about the uh, matter content of the universe. I mentioned that last time. I didn't really go into the details of why do we think that the um, universe is made the way it is made. So why do we think that the universe contains a certain amount of dark matter and dark energy? Though the idea is that in general we see something moving and we know that something must be behind uh, this uh, movement and so there must be some reason why we see for example stars moving in a galaxy at a certain speed or there must be some reason why galaxies are moving within clusters of galaxies so within large amounts of galaxies um, with certain properties with certain rotation speeds and so all of these uh, properties um, lead us to the belief that there is some unknown component, some dark component which we cannot see and is, um, however, is driving the motions of stars within galaxies and galaxies within uh, galaxy clusters, so within large um, ensembles or large sets of uh, galaxies. All right. Um, that's another question. So when, due to the expansion of the universe, we won't be able to see other galaxies uh, than our own. Actually, uh, the expansion of the universe is making, of course, some galaxies expand, like moving away from us. And eventually they will, uh, the recession speed, so the velocity at which they're moving from us will be so high that uh, we won't be able to see the light coming from them because the relative velocity between us and this galaxy will be so high that uh, it will be higher than faster than light basically the relative motion and this means that we won't be able to communicate with them but a large amount of galaxies will be still be uh, bound to us by gravitation and so not all of the galaxies will be uh, removed very far away from us just those that are above a certain distance right now some others will eventually merge with us or just stay in our neighborhood because gravity will dominate eventually over the expansion of the universe. But I, I will talk about this later on. Uh, so if I can see more of the velocity of light, can I watch the future? Well, in principle, you can watch. Uh, uh, doesn't make much sense this question, but. Uh, uh, I would say no, like, uh, or yes, maybe it's re actually like, because the velocity of lights is like the velocity of certain kind of signal. And so watching things actually means that you see them through lights. Actually, all the things that we see, they are mediated by light rays, by light waves. And this means that there is, um, by definition it's moving at the speed of light so at this stage like saying that something uh, goes uh, faster than light and emits maybe some kind of signal it would also mean that we might not be able to see that kind of signal because by definition everything we see is that uh, is is mediated by light but yeah you can think about other signals and then how to reconstruct them and then um, you should make another thing. I mean, it's complicated, but I don't really want to dig into that because it's more of a uh, speculative question and I I would need to think about it. Anyway, so I was talking about the fact that in the universe, we, uh, again, it's very important to know how to measure distances. And because of that, because of the fact that we didn't figure out for many years how to measure distances, um, the mainstream theory about the universe up to a hundred years ago, so it was uh, the first years of the 1920s, the dominating the theory was uh, was so-called, um, was that uh, there was no universe made of different galaxies, but basically our galaxy, so the Milky Way, was everything that existed. So this is this was why because we could see the stars within the Milky Way, we could see some nebulae, so there were some kind of uh, dust clouds that we could see 
in the Milky Way, um, which were actually faraway galaxies, but um, people could not realize that. And they thought they were just, uh, you know, like uh, clouds of gas and clouds of dust within the Milky Way. So they were not other galaxies, they were not other structures, they were not other isolated um, objects made of uh, billions of stars, but they were rather, you know, clouds. So it was a part of the uh, things that were inside um, our galaxy, so our, that was thought to be the whole universe. And they were just, you know, clouds, as I said. And it was not, they were not supposed to have stars within them. They were not supposed to have, you know, um, other complicated and large structures within them. They were thought to be simple, um, simple amount, you know, um, lumps of, of gas and, and dust. So, actually, this was until the 1920s, so it was up to, um, 100 years ago. To be honest, um, during history, there were a couple of researchers and philosophers that put forward the idea that these uh, clouds of gas were actually um, island universes, so there were other universes, just like our Milky Way, but, uh, you know, very remote and the fact that we see them as clouds of dust is due to the fact that they are very very far away and this idea was put forward by first as far as i know by immanuel kant so the famous uh, philosopher from Königsberg, and um, it was also put forward and defended by william herschel who was the discoverer of uranus so if you know as you should um Nanmar of Steel song, we say, a 6.2 inch telescope held in William Herschel's hand allowed the world to see how wide is Uranus. So this very same William Herschel that is featured on Nanmar of Steel song was also one of those who put forward the idea that the universe is not comprised of a single galaxy, that is the Milky Way, but there's many galaxies uh, that are spread all around and they are what we see as simple clouds of dust. And so this theory was called the Island Universe Theory, um, but it wasn't very popular, to be honest, until again 100 years ago. So what happened 100 years ago? That uh, Hubble, so Edwin Hubble, one of the greatest astronomers in history, and uh, is a guy that has just so many equations and factors, constants and numbers that are named after him. Um, that is just pretty much everywhere. Any single handle, I mean, I wouldn't say that because there was, of course, there were many other people whose contribution has also been sort of disregarded. But anyway, if you look at just by the simple uh, number of citations and the number of uh, times his name comes up, when you study cosmology, then you would think that this guy basically invented cosmology 100 years ago. And so what did this guy do in, uh, in the early 20s? He started po pointing his telescope um, to this nebulae, right? So there were these nebulae in the Milky Way that were thought to be clouds of gas. And then what happens? That... Um, at some point, and the first galaxy that he was actually looking at was this one that I'm going to show you, NGC 6822. Uh, let me just share the screen with you. Let me see if I can do that. Uh, right. So I guess you can see this. And so Edwin Hubble, a uh, hundred years ago, was pointing its telescope to this object. And what he found out is that this, you see, this uh, very thin layer of uh, something that looks like dust and gas was actually made of stars. They were stars. They were just look so faint because they are so far away. And how did he know that they were so far away? Well, as I said, there's a, a pretty much uh, reliable method to measure the distance of faraway objects, which relies on the CFA stars. So he was looking at objects that belong to this cloud of dust, I mean, again, it were belonging to this uh, NGC 6822. 
and he was uh, focused on some of the stars that belong to this object and he see he saw that these stars were fluctuating with a very constant period like uh, a few weeks and so using what he knew from the Milky Way and from the nearby stars, that is what he knew, there was this period luminosity relation uh, from the Cephates in the Milky Way. He reconstructed that. So by knowing that stars with a given uh, period, that is with a given separation between two peaks of luminosity, so the luminosity was going up and down very regularly. Um, and for each um, amount of time that was um, passing by the two peaks, you could actually say how high the original peak were, and so what is the original luminosity of the star, he could reconstruct the distance. And so he found out that there was no chance that this object, NGC 6822, belonged to the Milky Way. If there was no chance, like stars with those period and that kind of uh, luminosity um, fluctuations revealed the fact that they were so far away that could not possibly belong to the Milky Way. They must have been some other galaxy. And so he did the same measurement for, he repeated the same measurement for a lot of, um, of other galaxies. Well, a lot, at the time, I think it was around some tens or 20 galaxies. And he could determine the fact that there was, you know, these objects that he was looking at didn't uh, actually belong to our galaxy, were not nebulae, they were not clouds of gas and dust as people used to think up to that point but they were completely separated objects and this was the first again as i said there were some people that put this idea forward already back in the um, 19th and actually the 18th century with Immanuel Kant and uh, William Herschel but he was the first one to show that uh, there were objects there were large galaxies outside of our own galaxies, outside of the Milky Way. And so this is the first kind of uh, proof that was given for the uh, existence of other galaxies outside of our own. Right. So um, again, this whole measurement relied, this, I mean, at least at this stage, it relied on the Cephates. Again, these are these variable stars that help us understanding. They have a very strict relation between their intrinsic luminosity and the um, oscillation of their luminosity. And so once you know how often this star oscillates, then you can reconstruct their distance because you would know what the original luminosity would be. And so once you see the attenuation, you're again, you're able to reconstruct the actual distance to that object. So what happened? This was at the first, um, in the first years of the 1920s. And Hubble, uh, he had this uh, famous uh, observatory and Mount Palomar, I think it was called. And um, he was, uh, he just kept, you know, measuring the light that was coming from these uh, galaxies. At that time, like everyone was pretty much um, happy, sort of, uh, to accept the fact that there were other galaxies and we were not the only thing that existed. And uh, this was the first step, you know, to determine the fact that there were other objects and you could determine their distance. What happens then when you look at the light? So let me have a few words on how light works. So light is a... Um, it's basically um, a manifestation of the electromagnetic field. So any kind of particle which is charged, charged that interacts with the electromagnetic field can be a light emitter. So for example, electrons, um, they emit light. And when I say they emit light, it means that substance like shoots, that's what happens. So this is, uh, quant you know, in quantum mechanics, maybe you don't know, but just, you know, just to make things um, a little bit clear or less clear <laughs> for that matters, um, you have this wave particle duality, which means that certain particles have um, both behaviors. 
so you can uh, interpret them as uh, individual particles as well as uh, fields like waves so they are continuous entities that vibrate and so as waves you know they have a frequency and every wave has, has some kind of intrinsic uh, you know you can decompose it into intrinsic frequencies of vibration so why is this important this is important because we know that when light on earth when light interacts with any kind of material um, the material either absorbs some frequencies or reflects some other frequencies this is the same by the way it's the same with sound so you know that when you have a sound wave interacting with some walls or with some objects in a room or you know like some anyway it's, it's anything you might have some kind of uh, frequencies of sound that are absorbed some others are reflected some other just go through for example depending on the uh, of the wavelength of the sound and the same thing is with light and so why is this important this is important because when we look at light and we see that some frequencies are being absorbed then we can reconstruct the kind of material we can understand what was the material that was absorbing these wavelengths so for example if i know the source the source of sound and if i put some object in between and i see that this object is absorbing for example only the uh, very high frequencies then i have a way of understanding what is this object that is there in between right i can look at the pattern if i know the source I know what what I'm getting and then I sort of uh, I can try to understand what's there that is absorbing those frequencies or the other way it's uh, with light for example if we have some atom that is emitting light that's the same thing like um, if I have hydrogen or helium or I don't know oxygen that is uh, you know it's being um, heated up and it's like uh, throwing light um, again by light actually I mean the whole electromagnetic spectrum but you know light is like the um, <laughs> it's what we understand the most but again just to open a parenthesis when I'm talking about light and electromagnetic spectrum I'm actually talking about everything from radio waves to uh, ultraviolet so there's uh, infrared radiation there's uh, again radio radiation it's the it just it's just the same the difference between radio signals and uh, light signals is just the wavelength so it's just the distance between the peaks of the signal when you think about a sinusoidal peaks like a a wave and a, an oscillatory a signal then you just think about the distance between the peaks and that's the wavelength basically so um Again, I was saying that the way the spectrum is uh, emitted, so the way that you you know you can look at the spectrum and tell what is the source that is emitting the spectrum, based on the kind of uh, lines that are absorbed, because we know that some materials only absorb certain wavelengths, so you know that some materials only react to some wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so let me move on. Uh, okay, so this is before. Uh, <laughs> this is what I want to go to. So it's Hubble laws. So what's the point here? Is that let me let me move forward. Basically, is that. Um, let me talk about this unshifted, redshifted, and blue shifted uh, con concept. As I said, every material has a very special pattern of absorption and emission of light which means that if you you know if you decompose like with the prism you know you you see white light you decompose it into different colors then you would, might end up seeing that some parts of the of the colors are absorbed and this is what you see here in the unshifted spectrum and now you see these peaks here these black lines they correspond to the properties of the material which is emitting this kind of light. And we know on Earth that we can measure these lines for, uh, this is called unshifted, it's, so it's, it's like for a material which is um, 
here on Earth, and we can we know whose properties we know very well. Um, we can actually tell you if we see like the light spectrum with this uh, specific pattern of absorption lines, we can tell you what is the material that is emitting it. And we know that the relative distance between all these peaks will always be the same. So if, for example, I'm telling you that I have helium somewhere and this helium is emitting light, I can tell you that because I know that when I decompose the light with a prism and I look at the different frequency and the different wavelengths of light, and I see that some of them are being uh, absorbed, then I can tell you that uh, depending on the relative distance between the different absorption lines that you see here, I can tell you what is the original material. And it's, again, it's um, everything is dependent on the relative pattern of distance between the different between the different absorption lines so what happens is that um, what if i see the same pattern but it's red shifted which means you see here it shifted towards the red spectrum which is you have exactly the same lines that you should think them as a barcode so you just imagine you have a barcode you have the same barcode which is just being shifted a little bit to the right or to the left. Why is this happening? So you would say that this is the, exactly the same material that is being, you know, it's responsible for the emission of this light. But you see that these lights are shifted towards the red. So it means red light means lower frequencies or blue, which means higher frequencies. So, yes, you take a spectrometer and you decompose the light signal that is coming to you. You look at the relative positions of, again, of all these uh, parts of the light spectrum that are absorbed. You basically, again, you just think about a, um, you know, it's like a fingerprint. It's, it's like the same fingerprint, but it's, it's being, it's like a barcode, you know, it's, just think about a barcode, the same barcode. So the same distance between the black lines, but just move it to the left or to the right. You would say it's the same barcode, but it's being moved. And the question is, why is it being moved? So what Hubble discovered in 1929 is that no matter where you look at the sky, so you can look at any direction in the sky. You go there, you check for these nebulae. So you already discovered that there were different galaxies. So you look at these galaxies, you look at the safest star in them, you know how distant they are. And so you can reconstruct the, the distance of these galaxies from the Milky Way, from the place where we are. And for each one of them, you can take the light that's coming and the light that's coming, you do this trick of decomposing it and looking at this barcode. So you look at the absorption lines and you see that the, you do find patterns that uh, correspond to objects that actually are here on Earth. So you do find patterns of light that correspond to hydrogen, that correspond to helium on Earth, for example. But you see that they are shifted. Why are they moved? So it's the same barcode, but it's moved. So you know there's only one element in the universe, as far as we know, that can produce this kind of barcode, this kind of absorption light, but it's in the wrong place. So why? The point is that this is related to the Doppler effect in a way. It's called, you know, the Doppler effect is, is the effect that's related to the motion of sources. And so if you have, you can hear it, you know, if you, if there's, that's the typical things. If, if there is an ambulance that's moving towards you, you would hear the signal going higher and higher because the waves that are being emitted in your direction, they are, they are getting an extra boost sort of, and they are being compressed and they are getting to higher frequencies. And while the ambulance then is moving away, the, the frequency that is coming to you is being uh, stretched, which means that the same wavelength is being you know, it's being enlarged, so you, you end up with a larger wavelength. And so the, the, the thing that Hubble discovers is that if you look at the sky 
and you see that all of these galaxies, no matter in which direction you look at, they have the same pattern of motion towards the red. So you have a red shift of the of the light um, of the light of the stars. Um, then this means that there must be some motion of the galaxies. So the point is either we live in a very, 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 very special place in the universe where no matter where we look at, everyone is getting the fuck away from us. They just want to get as far as away as possible. They want, they are fleeing from us. Or there must be some kind of relative motion that is going um, all across the whole universe where all the galaxies are moving away from each other. So if everyone is moving away from everyone else, no matter where you stand in the universe, you would still see everyone moving from everyone else, pretty much by definition, right? So if you stand in a galaxy, if you stand in Milky Way, and then again, you look uh, north, south, east, west, no matter which direction in the sky you look, you would still see these uh, patterns of light from the faraway galaxies that match this uh, shifting towards the infrared. So shifting towards the lower frequency of the electromagnetic spectrum, which means that these objects are moving far away. Because again, if you think about an ambulance, if you think about the sound of a car or something else that is getting far away from you, um, you will hear at the same time that this, uh, the sound is not just fainter, but it's also um, moving to lower frequencies. So it's, uh, it's like um, it's moving to the uh, lower uh, ends of the, uh, you know, the audio spectrum. And so this is what you see. I mean, if this is your observatory here on the right and then you observe some galaxy on the left, if the galaxy is moving here, if like if there is some kind of motion, relative motion between us and the galaxy, what you expect is that the frequency of the light that is originally emitted by the galaxy will be stretched, right? And being stretched means that the peaks, as you can see here, the peaks between two waves are getting farther away from each other. Um, and so this is, it's called, this is the redshift. Redshift, again, is just the fact that light is being uh, moved, like a, a, a light signal that is being emitted from a faraway galaxy will reach us with a much lower frequency due to the fact that there is some motion going on between us and the galaxy. And so what was the finding of Hubble? is that once you know how much the galaxy is redshifted, so once you know how much, you know, this um, barcode that tells you the original uh, sequence, you know, the original um, element that was emitting the light, and so it's telling you what was the original um, shape of the light when it was uh, leaving the galaxy, then once you see that this is shifted, then you can compute the velocity at which this galaxy is moving away from us, which is called the recession velocity. Now, what Hubble found, and this is Hubble's law, it's one of the most important uh, laws of uh, cosmology since 100 years. It's basically, um, it's, it's like the basis of modern cosmology. No matter what you do, we will deal with this Hubble's law and it's uh, it's very simple but still it's very deep and it's very uh, important. What Hubble found is that the farther away this galaxy lie, these galaxies lie, the higher recessional velocity they have. And so you can see this in this graph. So if you plot on a graph the on the x axis the distance and uh, on the y-axis, the velocity of these galaxies. Again, you know the velocity because of the redshift, so because of the shift of this absorption light towards the red part of the, of the light spectrum. You can just plot these two quantities and you see that there's a linear relationship between them. And so 
um, the linear relationship means there is a coefficient, there is a number that, um, of pro that is making the proportion between the velocity and the distance. And this number is called the Hubble's constant. This basically means that once you know the redshift, so you know the velocity, you can measure Hubble constants. I won't dig into this, but let's say that we know this, then you can reconstruct the distance or the other way around. Let's say you know the distance because you measure the parallax or you measure the safe eight star, or I don't know, you have some supernovae and you can make some, um, you know, you make uh, some kind of uh, measurement for distance. Then from that, you can reconstruct you know, either the velocity or the, uh, the constant. Now, let me uh, talk about a couple of things. First of all, um, there are some gravity. I mean, of course, there are gravitational effects, which means that uh, galaxies have two sources of motion. One of them is just the fact that because of Hubble's law there, you know, and the expansion of the universe, which I will analyze a little bit more in detail, right now, but you know, let's just take the expansion for granted. But it is that you have two motions. So if you have the Milky Way at some point in space and you have another galaxy placed somewhere else, you have two effects. One is the gravitational um, attraction of the Milky Way towards this other um, galaxy on the one hand. And on the other hand, you have the um, expansion of the universe. So if the, so since the expansion of the universe, so the recessional velocity as we know by Hubble's law, is proportional to the distance. So again, the farther away, the fastest this expansion is working. Um, nearby galaxies uh, might be actually dominated by gravity. So the uh, motion of nearby galaxies might be dominated by gravity. And this is what happens, for example, with Andromeda, because we know that Andromeda galaxy, which is our large neighbor, is um, approaching the Milky Way at 110 kilometers per second, approximately. And so here we know that the gravity, the mutual gravity between Andromeda and the Milky Way is dominating. And so it's what's causing it to approach each other. And this means that on scales of a, uh, this I'm talking about 2 million light years, uh, gravity is uh, dominant. When you move to larger scales, to to farther away objects, then gravity is a law that, of course, it gets fainter, it gets suppressed with uh, with distance. So the farther away, the less um, you feel the gravity. And so you are purely dominated by the expansion. Now, how do these galaxies uh, drift? Now, the point is that there is no, as far as we know, there is no preferred direction in the universe. And this means that all galaxies are moving away from each other in the same kind of fashion. So there are, if you look at any radial direction, any galaxy will be moving away from you along this radial direction. And why is this the case? I think I can just show you um, a very simple picture. So what you see here, again, just imagine you look at uh, the universe from the outside. Um, just look at the universe from the outside like like this and um, imagine that you have galaxies and so what you're doing here at different stages of expansion is that these galaxies might have some gravity acting on the one end so it's it's acting on the um, positive side so to say and then the negative expansion side you have again the expansion and so this is sort of uh, counterbalancing it but the thing is that since what it's expanding here, it's not actually a motion between one galaxy and the other, but it's actual space that is getting uh, stretched because of the expansion. So the point is that you have just imagine two points that are fixed on some surface. And what you're doing is not moving the points, but rather enlarging the surface. And so if you think about a sphere like this with galaxies on top of it, and you think about, you know, the coordinates of these uh, galaxies on this sphere, what's going on here is that it's not that these galaxies are physically moving away, but it's rather space between them that is uh, getting inflated, it's getting expanded. 
It does look like these two things are moving away from each other because the effect in the end is the same. But the concept is different because when you say that space itself is moving, you're saying that every point in space, again, on very large scales, because otherwise you don't see it, but um, on very large scales, every point in space, every two points that you see, they will be uh, receding from each other, will be more and more separated. So this means that, again, if you look at the coordinates here on a sphere, that these two objects will, you know, will be on this kind of, uh, you know, always on the same point relative to these fixed coordinates, but you're just changing the scale here of the, of the um, you will be changing the scale of the coordinates on the sphere, on the surface. And so what, what turns out turns out in the end, of course, you can measure the distance and you see that the distance between these galaxies has increased with time. And again, it increases the more, the farther away these galaxies are from each other. It's a relative effect and it's linear, as I was showing before. If you look at this, uh, this is the Hubble diagram. Again, what you see here are the red, these red, uh, black dots are just measurements of galaxies. So again, you measure a galaxy's position, a galaxy's distance from us, you measure its uh, recessional velocity, and you see that there is this very, very precise law that is telling you that the farther away these galaxies are, the uh, faster away from us they are moving. Okay, and so again, this whole idea, just to recap on this part before I wrap up and finish, uh, this whole idea is based on the concept of redshift. So it's the idea that lights and again, in general, any kind of electromagnetic signal that is emitted from faraway sources gets stretched. In the meanwhile, because this source is moving away from us, is receding from us. And so this motion between us and this source is stretching the wave and is um, making its wavelength, so it's stretching lights or radio signals or gamma rays, infrared, UV radiation, whatever kind of uh, electromagnetic signal is being stretched. So it's becoming, it's getting a larger wavelength, which means it's moving to the red. Because red, the red part of the electromagnetic spectrum is the one that is associated with larger wavelengths and the blue part is associated with the shorter wavelengths. So if a galaxy were approaching us, like Andromeda, you would see the spectrum being blue shifted. And this is indeed the case. This is how we can measure the fact that Andromeda is approaching us because the light spectrum coming from Andromeda is blue shifted. But Andromeda and the Milky Way, they are very too close by galaxies. If you go to uh, farther away galaxies, then you would see that the spectrum is, is being systematically red shifted. Right? So, this was, again, this was the concept of blue shift, red shift, and there was a huge debate. The fact that the uh, universe is expanding is basically undisputed, as far as I know, in the, astro in the scientific community, in astrophysics and cosmology. You know, there are some facts like dark energy and dark matter, which are still disputed by some researchers. And it's good to, to have a debate on that because until you don't have like a smoking gun, you have this uh, very, um, this kind of very um, precise and clear proof. It's good to have dissent and, you know, to put forward other theories. But as far as I know, in my 10 years and more <laughs> experience in the field is that uh, the expansion of the universe is just a matter of fact, no matter what, um, what's your position on that. No matter what's your position on dark energy, dark matter, the Big Bang. And as a matter of fact, until the uh, 70s, 60s, there were two competing theories, which I guess I mentioned last time. And it was so the so-called Big Bang theory and it was the steady state theory. So the steady state theory said that the universe is expanding, but it's not like it's, it's getting, um, I mean, by, you know, if the space expands and you have the same number of galaxies, 
then the density would decrease of the galaxies, of course, because you're putting the same number of objects in a larger volume. So if volume, so if space is expanding, volume is expanding, you have the same number of galaxies as you had before and after, the density of galaxies is, 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 is smaller. But what happens if you had some kind of source of matter somewhere in the universe that will keep the density of uh, matter constant in the universe? Then you would have a steady state and it was called steady state because the idea was that the density, um, so the structure of the universe was not just the same in space because this is one of the key ideas of um, actually it's one of the principles so to say of modern cosmology that is that the universe is uh, homogeneous and isotropic which means that the distribution of galaxies if you look if you do some kind of average is the same no matter what you, where you are in the universe so there's no such thing as you know copernican um so it's it's, it's a sort of copernican principle thing related so there's no such thing as the earth is the center of the universe and everything is revolving around us but the idea is, is quite the opposite that the earth is just like any other place in the universe and if you are on the earth or if you are in the milky way or if you are on another galaxy which is you know maybe millions of, of light uh, years away from us um, it wouldn't change much you would see the universe on average like statistically it would look exactly the same in the sense that if you take a large volume you would see more or less the same number of galaxies the same number of voids the same number of galaxy clusters and so on and so forth so this is the idea of homogeneity and, isotro and isotropy but the thing is that in time when you look at this, uh, things in time there is a uh, an asymmetry so there is a space symmetry in the sense that where you do move no matter where you move in space you would always see the same kind of thing, which means that you have some kind of symmetry because, again, the universe does not depend on the exact point uh, in space where you look at it. You don't have any privileged um, frame of reference. But you do have something like that in time in the sense that the universe does have an evolution. And so if we believe in the Big Bang theory and if we believe that the universe was, you know, very much compressed at the beginning, then it expanded sort of it exploded then it started moving um, then you do have a, an asymmetry in time because the universe today is very different from the universe 10 billion years ago in terms of density of galaxies in terms of the kind of stars that were in the universe 10 billion years ago in terms of the kind of uh, gas that was you know permeating the universe there were a lot of things that were completely different chemical composition of the universe there were just so many things that were different. And so that's the uh, idea. So the steady state cosmology was called so, that way because the idea was that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic in space and in time. So if you look at the universe, if you were to look at the universe 10 billion years ago or 20 billion years ago, it would have looked exactly the same. So they, this, the, their claim was things are you know getting away but there's some kind of mechanism that it's still, it's completely feeling, you know, there's matter coming from sort of nothing, from some kind of quantum field. Just let me just put it that way. I don't know the details about what the mechanisms would have been for generating matter, but they show that uh, back then they, they believe that if you had even a very small amount of matter coming from vacuum, then um, you could make up for the loss of density related to the expansion of the universe. So the universe was expanding, but you, you could make up more galaxies while, it, you know, and so the density would be fixed and the properties of the universe would be the same in space and time. This turned out to be a wrong theory, it turned out to be falsified by um, the observation of the um, light of the Big Bang, so-called, so it's a, it's a CMB, it's cosmic microwave background radiation, which is basically the signal it's, that we see that's coming from the very early universe, where when all the matter was compressed and then, you know, the matter 
decompress started sort of to explode. There was a very uh, fast phase of, of expansion. And in this phase of expansion, then the universe emitted uh, photons that we can still see nowadays. And that's uh, like the first trace. It's like a tracer of, uh, it's a light actually of the, that comes from the very early phases of the life of the universe. But this is already, uh, this is too much. It's not what I wanted to talk about tonight. So again, uh, tonight's point was about Hubble's law, expansion of the universe. How do we know that this happens and what do we do with this? Uh, just to, to wrap up, just to give you an idea, uh, let me tell you that today we uh, can measure Hubble constant with a very precise value. It's around, actually there is some conflict because there are several ways you can measure it. And so there is this so-called Hubble controversy nowadays, uh, which consists in the, in the fact that um, some measure give a value of the Hubble constant, which is around 67 kilometers per second. Some others give a measurement that is around 72 kilometers per second. So there is like five kilometers per second discrepancy. And it's significant actually, because these values are very precise. And so we still don't understand why these different measurements give uh, different values. But to put things in perspective, when Hubble found this law with the first measurements, he thought that the constant should have been something around 500 kilometers per second. So it was completely off the, the value that we know it's, uh, it's closer to the real value today. And up until the 90s and the early 2000s, the, um, we couldn't really understand whether it was, I mean, we couldn't really measure the precise value. And the value was estimated to be something between 50 and 100 kilometers per second. So uh, since nowadays we are uh, sort of confident that this value lies between, it lies around 70 kilometers per second. Actually, sorry, it's 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, which means that an object, if you put a still object at, seven, at one megaparsec from us, which is 3 million light years from us, this would move with a velocity, a recession velocity, so it would be moving away from us with a velocity of 70 kilometers per second. An object at six uh, light year, uh, sorry, six million light years from us would be moving at 140 kilometers per second. Again, assuming that there's no other proper motion, which is the motion determined by the local gravitational field, and so on and so forth. So the value is, is, is 70, uh, it's around 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So objects that are like uh, hundreds of megaparsec away from us, they're moving at, uh, you know, hundreds time, you know, it's like a few thousand kilometers per second. And that's actually a way of uh, measuring distances. Um, actually in cosmology and astronomy, sometimes you um, just give the recession velocity of this object. So you just say this, kilo this object is uh, 6,000 kilometers per second away from us, which doesn't make much sense if you look at that <laughs> face value. But, you know, there are some constants and, you know, we know that uh, at some point, even if, again, galaxies have some intrinsic motion due to the gravitational fields that lies in, in the local, in their neighborhood, um, eventually at very far away distances, um, the um, expansion takes over and it's the only factor that matters um, at that point. So I hope you had uh, an interesting time with me. I really uh, want to tell you that I'm very happy you had the patience to listen to me and to my <laughs> rant about the Hubble constant and the expansion of the universe. And if you have any last question, just uh, write it down here in the comments and I will try uh, to, to answer it. So there's a question I didn't un answer before. So how do we consider the void in which galaxies are moving? Is that still considered to be space? Yes, well, voids, are, first of all, voids are not actually completely void. So if you do observe in detail the voids, you see that uh, they have some kind of inner structure. So uh, the space is not really always void. You know, you have some kind of quantum effects and you have all sorts of particles traveling through the space. So 
it's never completely empty. But what we call voids, which means large regions of space that are under dense, so they have a much uh, lower number of galaxies than the average. So yeah, you, you have a, an average number of stars per unit volume, you have an average number of uh, galaxies per unit volume in the universe. Those parts of the universe whose, um, they have a very uh, small value of the average, again, uh, number of stars and, um, and galaxies within them, they're called voids. And they are regions actually from which matter is, you know, there is this uh, interesting effect that they are under dense, so they have low gravity, and so they cannot keep matter within them. So if you take a void, it's like you, you think of uh, about a region where there's a few galaxies, like a few small galaxies, maybe a few filaments of gas. Uh, but on the edge of voids, by definition, you have matter, and so you have a region with very few matter, which uh, borders with other regions with more matter, and so more matters means more gravity. And so it, this means that the matter within the void will be sucked into these other regions like filaments, or there might be some walls or also called sheets of, uh, of matter. Sometimes you have uh, clusters of galaxies. And so these other regions where you do have galaxies and stars, they are more heavy. They are on the border of voids. And so they are more heavy. They have more gravitation. They, with their gravitation, they take, uh, they suck, more uh, matter from the voids so the voids become even more empty and so there's like this kind of spiral because once they are emptier once you empty the voids of the matter they have less um, gravity within them which means that they have less um, counter force because gravity is a force that tends to pull you know like to pull things one to each other like to to, to bring them closer together and uh, empty space due to the expansion of the universe is, is going in the other direction. So if you have empty space, you have pure expansion with no counter effect from gravity. Um, okay, so there's another question. Other than uh, general relativity, is quantum mechanics used a lot in astrophysics? Yes, yes, yes. All the, for example, all the theory of absorption lines in uh, material, so all the theory about uh, the uh, barcode of the light is based on quantum mechanics because quantum mechanics is uh, the theory that, um, how do you say, it's, it's like the one that describes the motion of uh, electrons in the atoms. And so the interaction between electrons and light. So you have an atom and you have an electron moving around it and you know that there's radiation you know, interacting with it. So you have photons and electrons interacting to each other. All of this part is uh, described by quantum physics. Uh, it's either quantum physics or quantum field theory. So this is the interaction of uh, quantum physics and special relativity theory. But this, th especially quantum physics, is very useful to understand uh, why do some um, atoms emit or absorb light at certain frequencies because with quantum mechanics, you can sort of construct the orbits. Or if you know the, if you remember from chemistry, you had this, uh, the shape of distribution of electrons around the atoms. And so this is related. It's, it's I mean, quantum mechanics, it's, it's also telling you the energy at which uh, each atom is absorbing or emitting energy, sorry, emitting light. So it's it's basically this it's a description of the um, of the energies that uh, an atom I mean an electron that is bound to a nucleus so it, an atom again at um, what kind of frequencies it can emit and so you can compute that very precisely and so this is how you know that uh, when you see an absorption line you know the element that was creating that absorption line or emission line. Because again, this is the fingerprint that elements um, are, um, that all chemical elements, all the atoms on, you know, any kind of um, uh, thing that is interacting with light, it's leaving a fingerprint on it. And thanks to quantum mechanics, we can understand uh, why 
is this fingerprint, why it has the shape it has, and we can also recognize these patterns. We can link them to the um, to the original uh, um, to the original elements. And again, once you know this, for example, it's very useful because you look at light coming from a star, and then you can understand by this pattern you can look at the chemical composition of the star, because you would see, for example, some lines of absorption that are related to oxygen, some others are related to carbon, some others are related to nitrogen, some others are related to helium. And so looking at these lines, you can look how deep they are, how much absorption is going on there, uh, how uh, wide is this absorption. There's lots of processes that tell you uh, about the uh, chemical composition of the star. So even though the star is very far away, and you cannot really go there, you know, take a chunk of a star and uh, analyze the elements that are there. Just looking at the light and the imprints on the light by using quantum mechanics, uh, quantum mechanical theories of uh, interaction of light with matter, you can understand how much of each element is there. And it, this is very important because then we can look at galaxies and understand, for example, uh, how old they are because we know that heavier elements are being produced by stars. And so to have a certain amount of heavier elements like, I don't know, iron or even oxygen or, car or carbon. By looking at these abundances, then you can understand uh, how old the galaxy is, because you know that you would need at least some generations of stars, of stars burning elements to uh, create that amount of uh, heavy um, atoms, like again, oxygen or carbon. And so, and all of this, again, it's based on quantum mechanics. So it's based on laws that we tested, as far as I know, only on Earth, maybe International Space Station, maybe something on Mars. I mean, we didn't really go uh, to other parts uh, outside of the solar system to test these laws, whether and, and see whether quantum mechanics is true also on, I don't know, on other stars. I would say yes, there's no reason why it shouldn't be. As far as we know, it's, it's pretty much reliable and it's, you know, that it makes a um, very uh, consistent picture. So, yeah. Um, all right, so let me go to the last question. Okay, so why are we still able to see the Big Bang background radiation? Shouldn't this radiation be on the edge of space? Well, no, because this radiation is like pretty much everywhere in space. It was like emitted by every point in space. It's not that, again, there is no like preferred direction in space. Everywhere you look, it should be the same. And so every point is, is just emitting a three, you know, on the whole sphere, on the on any on all directions. So even if you expand, you would still see the light coming from other points because it's coming from every direction, and that's what you actually see. So, but I want to talk about the cosmic microwave background and the Big Bang uh, on the next Gattocast episode. I think, uh, yeah, I think that this. So there's another question, but this is. Uh, it's complicated, as Laura says, and uh, I wouldn't want to dig into this because it would take uh, a lot more time. But uh, yeah, so thanks a lot for being with me tonight. I hope you enjoyed uh, this uh, talk about the expansion of the universe. I hope you <laughs> that there was something that will remain with you. Again, there was some bottom line, some lesson that you might uh, keep from tonight's uh, time spent with me. And um, I think that's it. So see you in the future.